right. Well, thank you guys for um, joining us today. Um, it's so nice during this time to be able to talk about collaboration. It's something that argument driven inquiry is really based on. And it was wonderful. Uh, first of all, thank you to the Pocket Lab team. You guys have done an amazing job. Um, it is no small feat to organize all of these people and uh, get us all ready to go. So big shout out to you guys and we really appreciate it. Um, and also to my co-presenters, it's been lovely hearing everybody so far. And I just wanna talk a little bit about collaboration and we're really gonna focus on three-dimensional lab investigations. We are not a curriculum, um, but we are an instructional model for labs. And so our goals for this talk are gonna be just reviewing three-dimensional learning a little bit. I will be kind of talking through um, science standards, but I'll try to keep pretty general terms since I realize we're not all in the same state. And we're gonna talk through some strategies for this new online learning um, environment that we've all been thrown into, and then review some best practices to remember as well. Um, so again, my name is Leanne Gleim. I'm the account executive at Argument Driven Inquiry. Um, you see my email and my Twitter handle there as well. And I want to take us back right to a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away about a month and a half ago when we were still in the classroom. Um, and a lot of us were focused on some of the shifts that have been going on in science education um, for quite a while since the framework for K-12 science education kind of came out. And now we have NGSS and a variety of state standards guiding some of the things that we were initially trying to do. So I wanna set the stage here with some of the instructional shifts that are called for in these documents. So just a few of them, I have a couple examples here. So we're gonna do less, spend less time with big demonstrations in front of the class and more time in student community centered type groups where they're gonna be doing um, learning in hands-on collaborative environments that are a little bit more authentic to science. And another one um, is gonna be that students are gonna be spending less time following traditional lab experiences. So this is a little bit more specific to argument-driven inquiry um, and to some of the, the three-dimensional labs you may hear have heard of three dimensions thrown a lot around a lot, and we'll delve into that in just a second. And we're gonna spend more time, here you see a student that would be in stage two of ADI uh, working in her group to design their own investigation about how they're gonna study a phenomenon. So we're really gonna ground the three dimensional conversation in some of these instructional shifts. But now, as um, Mandy and Jessica called it, we're all in the COVID abyss. And so here you see um, our co-founder, Dr. Victor Sampson there, and his uh, group of recruited uh, a family of students because we really wanted to try this out a little bit. So let's discuss norms, right? We're all in this new normal um, and trying to figure out what's going on. We know some best practices for our students are establishing some norms. So one of the things that we've really delved into is just some of the research. We are not an online learning company. We are, um, you know, into science proficiency, we have researched our instructional model, but now we're, we're right there with the rest of you trying to figure out, okay, what does this look like for teachers? What can we be doing? So um, as some of you may know, the research on um, e-learning for secondary is not super robust. And I really delved into one of the articles that was cited in a, a few of the papers that I looked at, and it outlined a few principles for effective pedagogy. As you are all probably well aware, um, students are going to be more responsible for looking at, for working independently. And what does that look like for our students? Uh, we also want to include interactivity and we can do that through maintaining some collaborative, um, we can plan for some collaborative activities. And that's certainly what we're going to talk about here in a, a little bit today. And then we also want to maintain our online presence and that's done through social, cognitive, and some of the teaching practices that we're going to be implementing during this time. So one of the things that really came out through a few of our webinars that we've been doing with um, uh, regularly just to support the, the uh, districts that we work with is what are some norms for online learning? So this is by, by far not a well-researched list. All I did was kind of lended uh, or did a quick Google search, looked at some of the e-learning websites, as well as some external organizations for science, and just came up with a few basic things that we thought worked really well. And that's establish some time management. And in this environment, in this abyss, we are not just um, talking to our students about their own time management, uh, but about their family situation. How many computers do they have? Internet access, who needs to be doing what when? Um, we also want to help support them by uh, helping them set up a good learning environment, you know, suggesting they don't stay in bed and maybe find a space where they can have some peace and quiet. And then one of the things that I'm going to talk about a little bit more here is communication. 
not just between you and your students, um, but among your students as well is key. Really supporting them, having empathy and kind of that bottom line down there. We're all in this together, right? We're all figuring it out. And we certainly wanna be patient and work together to support our students and make the most sense of this new environment. So here is a little adaptation that I wanted to expand upon for uh, e-learning communication. Some collaborative tasks really uh, require students to, to take risks, right? They're putting their ideas out there. They're being subjected to critique. And we want to make sure that's done in a safe way amongst each other, much like we hope we do in the scientific learning community. We want our students to be able to do that as well. So just a few adaptations from our rules for critique poster. And that starts with be respectful, right? We want to critique ideas and not people that help strengthen arguments. We want to read what others are saying really carefully. Um, and we want to be specific when we're, when we're communicating and giving detailed suggestions. Be positive. Most certainly we have to have that. We need to give compliments, provide some positive feedback, and celebrate uh, classmates' victories. And then lastly, we want to be helpful. We want to make sure our students are adding to the conversation and offering specific suggestions to help each other out. So let's dive into keeping things three-dimensional, right? How do we ensure that our students are still participating in this content that research has so shown and that our standards support are, are really gonna help science proficiency? And so there's just a general list of the science and engineering practices right there. And I'm gonna give you some suggestions on some of the things that we can do to be able to still have our students participate in these practices. So a few um, simulations that I just wanted to throw out there that work really well with a lot of our materials and that we've heard from other teachers. FET simulations are a great resource along with Concord Consortium. These are not a, a be all end all, but if you are looking for some ways for students to still participate in lab activities, these can be a good place to start. And then one of the other things that I wanted to discuss um, is argument driven inquiry. So we didn't want to just talk about it. We wanted to try it out, right? So we did this with one of our grade three uh, lab six life in groups. So why do wolves live in groups? And so we recruited um, a small little pilot here, about 10 kids ages seven to 17 years old. And there on the right, you see our co-founder, Dr. Vic Sampson. He is um, orchestrating one of our labs online with this group. Now these are family groups. So you will see some pictures of students that are actually in the same location. And that's because their family members. So that's kind of why um, you'll see multiple students in the picture. So let me give you a quick rundown of the stages of argument-driven inquiry. So again, we're able to be inserted into any lab, uh, into any curriculum in place of a typical lab activity. And even if you don't, haven't used or heard of ADI before argument-driven inquiry, you can certainly use um, some of the stages or a group of them to be able to enhance some of your um, online learning uh, strategies, right? So it's going to be the same eight stages in any lab that you do. And these are the same from grades three to 12. And those are the materials that we really cover because we're pretty, or the age groups that we really cover because we're pretty heavy on English language arts. And um, so we really start at grade, grade three and move through most of the, the basic secondary content areas. So here are some of the, the things that we're going to do with our students to be able to uh, implement some of those science and engineering practices. You see an example of one of our student lab handouts and the goals of our first stage is just to introduce some, some information. In this case, it's inheritance of blood type. In our pilot case, it was um, why do it was why do wolves hunt in groups? So students are going to obtain some information about disciplinary core ideas and cross cutting concepts or performance expectations, phenomena, however you want to describe how you um, make up your curriculum. And they're going to figure out what are we going to be doing? There's going to be a, a guiding question in our case or a phenomena that they're studying here. And then this is where we really um, separate from traditional science lab instruction. And we ask students to design their own investigations and uh, to answer the question that we're having them look into. So if you've ever seen guided inquiry before, we would be considered a guided inquiry um, instructional model. And of course, here is a great example of virtual data collection. So this is from our pilot. And these are a couple siblings sitting here. I'm going to kind of talk over the video as I play it. They are watching some wolves hunting bison. And they are collecting data on how many wolves that they are seeing. So here in just a second, they're going to get another data point. Three. So there, they just found their, their third wolf. And this is very um, typical if, if you notice uh, one of our younger 
pilot students is on here and I believe she's in third or fourth grade. Um, and so, you know, she's sitting there with an older sibling, which may be something that is going to happen with some of our elementary teachers that are out there. Your students are going to need support. And um, so certainly it's not going to always happen. But in this case, we just had siblings together. So there's an example of how our students were collecting some data. So after they've collected that data, they're going to analyze and interpret it in there. The classroom group that you see is actually creating an initial argument. And I'm going to refer to that as well as an, as a, as an artifact, because it doesn't have to be uh, the specific argument the way we have it set up, but they're using a tentative medium. And we really chose a tentative medium on purpose. We want students to understand that their initial argument is tentative, right? It's going to change, but we need to get our ideas down there um, so that they can convey them to their science community in their classroom. And then we're going to give them a chance to argue from evidence. The whiteboard that you see here is um, a chemistry ADI lab on the thermal, the thermal decomposition of sodium bicarbonate. And we presented um, students with four different uh, equations and they had to use molar mass to kind of figure out um, which equation applied once they ran their um, experiment. So continuing on with our e-learning pilot, here we have a student that is um, sharing, discussing, and critiquing the artifact that they created, in our case, an argument on a whiteboard. And this is just a simple screenshot from Flipgrid where students can throw up an example of some of the information that they collected. And then they can also kind of shoot a short video that they can share with classmates. Uh, certainly if live video chat isn't an option, this works out really well. And then we also want our students uh, to be able to write about what they figured out and then evaluate texts written by peers. We want to give them an opportunity to engage with the phenomenon in all these different ways. And then we're also going to work on ways to include cross-cutting concepts. So here's just a short list there. These are some that um, can transcend content areas or can be within content areas. In general, we recommend that you pick one or two to really emphasize during a lesson and kind of make those um, explicit throughout. So again, just to review, there are some of the eight stages that can be included in argument-driven inquiry. We really uh, do a great job with including all of the practices, but in this case, being able to implement any of them really helps. So all that's amazing, and all of you have infinite amount of time to be able to plan for these things, but how in the heck, where do we start, right? So when all of this kind of started a few weeks ago, our professional learning team put together um, a planning guide for online learning. We really wanted to support teachers in general, no matter what they were doing, with finding some ways to, to just get started and what this looks like. Uh, for our students. And so on this planning guide, which is available for free on our website, you see it there and I'll be sure to share the links with uh, the pocket lab crew. We've got kind of some space to be specific with the three dimensions that we're covering as we're planning this for our students. And certainly you can use this from your already established curriculum um, or, you know, if you're, if you're kind of diving into whole new activities, you can be sure to fill that out as you go. We also want to look at what our phenomenon and guiding question is going to be. And then we also want to kind of integrate our backwards design here. How are we, what, what is the goal that we want uh, from our students? And then how are we going to get them to that point? Thinking of, in our case, what is a great argument for a given content area? And then from there, designing our supports around that. And one thing that I really want to point out here uh, under the learning activities section, I won't take you all the way through it, but because we are in an e-learning environment, we really want to emphasize the framing the activity section here because students are now learning online. There is so much peripheral noise, not just with maybe the um, software they're engaging in online, but also with their physical space. So we want to make sure we're really concise and we're making it clear what we're expecting of our students. Here's just a quick glance at the back of that plan tool as well where you can build in some other things for your reference and this is a great way to share it with other teachers as well. So let's dive back, let's dive into what collaboration looks like online. Absolutely number one, we want our students to be safe, right? Uh, please follow your district policies and recommended platforms. You'll hear me talking about learning management systems and that's kind of always my frame of reference uh, for, for use those first and then some of these other things can be auxiliary especially when you're considering what the best software is to, to use. You are professionals, you know your students best, certainly, and so you know a little bit more about what some, more than what some of my general suggestions can touch on for your students. And then I really want to encourage um, video chat, if possible. I don't know if anybody else has participated in any sort of, um, like, 
video happy hour or whatever, but just being able to, to see other people and FaceTime people is so great. So if possible, I really encourage you to be able to um, organize that with your students, even if it's just once or twice, um, because I know it's a lot to take on. So how are some ways that we can build in student collaboration? Google Suite is a great way to do that. Google Chat, super simple. Your learning management system may have message boards. Certainly text and phone calls can be used, but it's really great if it's somewhere that you can see some of the conversations that are going on um, so that it can inform the choices you make down the way. And then of course, video chat and then Google Docs is a great central location um, for students to be able to work on collaborative artifacts. So some of the things to consider when we're doing this would be the type of environment that you're in. Are you in a synchronous environment where everyone is online at the same time? And if so, consider how those students are going to break out into small groups. A lot of what I'll be talking about, um, especially when we're collaborating, is going to be around small group work. Um, and certainly it can be done in partners, but you really want to make sure that they're able to communicate. And then if you are in an asynchronous environment, meaning students are accessing the material and somewhat self-pacing, depending on when you have due dates, consider or the time needed for groups to get together as well as group size. I think we've really through our pilot and through some of our other conversations decided that three works really well. Any more than that, it's going to be a little harder to coordinate schedules, um, but that gives enough students in the group that uh, they'll be, uh, it'll spark conversation a little bit more. So again, diving back into some of the research, this was actually uh, from an article that was on science education in the ninth grade classroom. And so um, obviously at the beginning, online learning is gonna require teachers to have a greater presence. Many of you are in the thick of that right now. And you know, for some of us, you have 160, 175 students and they all need your support. So what can we offer you to help support you as you are trying to help them? And we also want to break things down so that we can give fewer and simpler instructions. If you've ever been on an online learning course, that is so key and so helpful. So I just want to reiterate that small groups are important. So many of the things that I'm going to be talking about, we're going to have the students work on one artifact per group, whether that's a whiteboard, whether that's a lab write up, whether that's a lab report, whatever. We want them communicating about that artifact so that they're really having to think through their ideas as they're making sense amongst their group. And then finally, it's also a really important best practice for learning in science. So here's an example of my sample uh, online learning management system. I put up a little Google sheet here and kind of decided how I was going to organize my groups. So, so again, this is a great resource just for you to be able to figure out how to get groups together and make it a little simpler on yourself. So I'll point out some key features here. Here's where I put my groups and just gave a space for them to put their meeting date and time in any link. Maybe that's a Google chat link, Zoom whatever, so that I could easily pop in if they needed me. And then again, like the research supports, we really want to have their tasks very specific. And this is kind of what I call a virtual lanyard. So we really like to do colored lanyards and assign our students numbers when we're doing ADI labs. So in this case, uh, my member number one is going to get assigned something during this like 20 minute segment. So there, I have allotted time for small talk. We all need that and students are going to do it anyway. And then if you look at task number three, when they're looking at the guiding question to dive into this new investigation, I assigned them a time and then I said number one is going to be doing the writing. This really makes it clear who this is expected of. Obviously, if groups have issues below that, I made my information available there. And then I really recommend Calendly. It's a great simple scheduling platform for teachers, um, for students to be able to just reserve a time and it syncs with your calendar. So when you are busy in the evening, block that off if you can, and then students won't be able to schedule anything there. Also just made the uh, due date very specific on there and to be able to incentivize them. Why is it worth their time? I wanted to show them what is next. So if you notice it says ADI and then I'm going to send them their group data in this case. So I wanted them to understand, um, you know, if you work together, you get this accomplished. Here's what you're going to get and this is how it's going to help you in the future. And then just down at the bottom of this page, you can see my different stages of the process. So I wanted them to know what was coming and be able to build on that. So here's a classroom artifact example. This is one of our whiteboards. It's kind of going back to uh, they use blood typing to figure out if all three of Mr. J's biological offspring are his. A little uh, Jerry Springer going on here to recommend if further DNA testing was needed. 
And so here's some ways that we can make our student thinking visible. We utilize the whiteboard, but web white web whiteboard is a really great free resource where students can throw up any graphic text, they can annotate, they can draw. So it's wonderful for elementary, it's great for science, even some other subjects, maybe not as much English, but um, a great way to be able to have students put together their ideas and um, in, a, in a simple central format. And down there, you can see just a quick one minute demo, super easy for students to use. Obviously, Google Sheets. Um, when I show you whiteboards, here is our basic lineup. We want students to have the guiding question there. They're gonna make their claim explicit. And then we've got a place for evidence. And we kind of lump evidence and reasoning, if you've heard of claim evidence reasoning before. We put all that together under the evidence section. And then in justification, we really want them to tie that back to the core idea or the phenomenon that they're studying. This evidence is great, but why does it matter that Mr. J does not have the allele that a child possesses? What does that mean for all of this? Another few ways to make students thinking visible to that I definitely recommend bio render. It allows you to make simple graphic, graphic organizers, flow charts. So the students can go in there and be able to put together just a, a simple flow chart like this one. And also Chemex, because chemistry teachers need love too. And when you use online simulations, sometimes it can be hard to see where your students are at with that. So these are just some basic things where they can kind of visualize what might be going on and put together a graphic of what would be expected in given um, situations there in a chemistry lab. So as we're kind of uh, considering how we're gonna plan for collaboration here through, through the remainder of some of these activities, I want you to remember back if you've ever taken an online course and how much you preferred interacting with the instructor because research obviously supports that that's the case. But if we motivate our groups and if we give them rewards for those co collaborative activities that they're participating in, it's really gonna still help them achieve those positive outcomes. So how can we provide students opportunities to um, give and receive feedback? That's a little bit of a, a tough thing here in, in the new online learning environment. And again, going back to the research, any, any classroom research in general shows that immediate feedback is important. And the same is to be said for the online learning environment. So again, just to, to reiterate back, we have a lot of students. So how are we going to give them this feedback that they need in this setting? Well, the great thing is you can have them interact with one another and we've got a few suggestions for what that looks like so that they're giving each other immediate feedback and then you're also able to um, help them with kind of those higher levels of learning of um, assessing and evaluating information. So another free resource that we really like is peer grade and groups can be able to you can set up your classes groups can upload their artifact again be that a whiteboard and a, um, a lab report whatever and the teacher can assign that artifact artifact to a group to review and then um, the owners of the artifact can discuss via a designated medium if this isn't live again flipgrid is a great resource that i mentioned earlier they can make super simple videos share their artifacts on there and kind of annotate in a short video and then the reviewing group can give them feedback same thing recording a short video asking questions asking for clarification just using something as simple as flipgrid and we have had teachers in the classroom use this with um, really good success pre the COVID abyss. Again, shout out to um, Killer Snails for the term that I am now favoriting. Um, so here's, here's an argumentation. So I wanted to give a quick example of what feedback looks like. So in stage four, our students are going to have an initial argument on a whiteboard answering the guiding question. And then they are going to present that information to members from a review group that is coming to see them. So again, back to my virtual uh, hypothetical learning management system here. And you can see I've got my simple tasks and I'm gonna ask my students to do two rounds of argumentation virtually, seven to nine minutes each. And when you see the stay or stray, the presenter is going to stay and then the reviewers are going to stray to a new group. So down here, I called upon my um, coaching and tournament alignment abilities from way back in the day. And I'm just gonna zoom in there on a second. This is how I set it up. So my argumentation in round one, member one, again, I don't have to type all students' names, save yourself the time. I had those numbers over their names already. Member one is gonna stay and present and then members two and three are going to stray. 
So in my uh, asynchronous environment, I tried to put some times out for this. I thought it would be really helpful. It may not be possible, but I wanted to give them a starting point to decrease frustration. So the presenter from Quarantine Dream is going to stay and present their artifact or their initial argument. And then the reviewers um, from so over it, like all of us are, are going to stray and critique their initial argument or artifact. So just a simple way to kind of make it clear what students are doing um, and you can continue alternating groups kind of through additional rounds as needed. So we want to be able to help uh, help our students see the value in this, right? So we have a simple um, free download. Again, I'll share this in just a minute for the argumentation session, but it works well for um, any ways that students are critiquing and interacting. So there's notes for the presenter. And then down at the bottom, there are notes for reviewers, interesting ideas from other groups that they saw, questions to take back to my group. And this really, uh, they don't have to have this form in general. You can tell them what or just show them an example to physically write down or to create in a Google Doc. And it's a really nice centrally located way for them to keep their information. And then when they bring it back to their group, everybody has a record of you know, where they were at on that day. So just as I'm wrapping up here, I wanna review a few best practices to remember. Again, we talked about establishing norms and how important that is for our students and especially for collaboration and working in a lab environment online. Um, and we want to encourage collaboration among students and really, um, you know, put them in the position of being the owners of what counts and what doesn't count in our online learning environment. Making student thinking visible, providing feedback in a variety of ways. And then I didn't really address this here in this talk, but I think it, it deserves pointing out is time for students to ask questions, not just in the class, but with you as an instructor. How are you going to set it up in a way that values your time and um, your responsibilities at home, but also be available to them? I feel like, you know, that's what the thousand dollar question these days is we're all wearing many hats. Um, and then just some final parting thoughts. So again, why collaborate? If students are struggling with reading, writing, speaking, or listening in the context of science, it means they need to do that more. We wanna give them more opportunities to obtain, evaluate, and communicate information. And then we also want more, uh, we want to emphasize that the more thinking students have to do, the more they learn. So ask yourself as a teacher, who is doing all the conceptual work of deciding if we have figured this out or not? Is it you or is it the students? How do they have a voice in your classroom? And then how, who decides what counts as high quality during a lesson? I think we, we're really um, grounded in students having a voice in those conversations and helping make sense of it because it really deepens their learning and understanding of science. So again, just to review, we went over uh, how to keep instruction three-dimensional and really just even kind of defining what three-dimensional is, some strategies for online learning, and then some best practices to remember. So I'm going to go through just a few of the resources, resources that I shared, and then um, I'm happy to do some Q&A here for a few minutes. So I already mentioned we have a lot of free supports available, and there's our, our website right there. And I mentioned some of the free instruct instructional materials that we have available. And you can see that link right up there on top. And then um, under the scaffolding materials is most of the stuff that I referenced today. So you can see the planning for online learning and then the argumentation note sheet. I will say we added an online materials section to this page. So I believe some things have moved around a smidge since uh, I took the screenshot the other day. But um, just wanted to share what's available on that page. There's that argumentation sheet. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about argument-driven inquiry, our investigations are available online. Um, we do have books from grade three up through secondary subjects, and you can see the table of contents uh, for those books as well as a sample ADI lab. So you just uh, select a book, in this case it was Earth and Space Science, scroll to the details section, and there you can see the hyperlink where you can get a sample lab. I do believe the grade three lab six, uh, why do wolves hunt in groups is our sample investigation online. We have some other professional learning opportunities, additional webinars. We made a general making the most of online learning webinar a couple weeks ago to support all of our teachers. We have a great Facebook group where teachers are able to interact and share ideas with each other. Same Twitter, uh, much like with the conference hashtag. Um, we've been sharing that out today as well. And then how to videos. They're not, they are specific, some of them for ADI, but there are some general ones um, like the, the establishing norms for 
uh, online communication is based on one of our posters and that's also featured in uh, the support videos section there that really helps um, with science instruction in general. So I just wanted to share that we do have additional online learning opportunities should you need them for PD hours or professional learning and we're happy to offer Science is Cool attendees 40% off of our online course. Um, it takes about six hours and you can do it at your own pace. It's a great thing that you can reference back to even next year when you get there. And you can read more about that on our website. Um, so thank you all so much. Thank you again, Pocket Lab, um, for making uh, this opportunity available and happy to answer any questions that we have. Okay, um, Leanne, thank you so much. It's great to have have you part of it here. Can you stop your screen sharing, by the way? Yep. So. Oh yeah, sorry. I guess I should give you. <laughs> okay. I, I have to remind you. <laughs> this is all all new to us too, so we're <laughs> we're figuring it out as we go. So, <laughs> apologizing for any mistakes. No, well, all you guys are doing great. That was really helpful. I I will say I we've gotten one request, uh, pretty much for every presentation. Is that are your slides available? Yeah, we have some proprietary information available, but I can certainly um, get get a slide deck ready to share. So what we'll do, so everybody knows, we're going to send out uh, a follow-up email tomorrow. I think it's probably going to be Monday because I, I see a lot of the requests and it might take us a couple of days to put stuff together, but we'll make sure everybody gets the links to the slides and, and your materials and stuff. And I hear everybody is making great offers and you did too for people who are stuck at home and need stuff so we'll make sure everybody gets that a couple couple good questions um one question was i have used adi quite a bit and students uh, sometimes struggle with the justification section can you explain or provide more detail on like high low medium justification work yeah, absolutely. That is um, the thousand dollar question for us. And we do have a great support video that addresses how to help uh, justification, but really helping our students get to that point. Some of the simple things that you can do is um, have them do an argument sort. So you can get some samples from previous years or put together some on your own and have them sort um, the strongest arguments and the weakest and then talk about those pieces. And the one nice thing about our materials in particular is we really try to incorporate the core idea phenomenon, uh, the content that the performance expectation is addressing in our handout. So I found myself as a teacher constantly saying, did you look at your handout? Why does your handout say that's important? What does that mean in terms of inheritance of blood type or wolves hunting in groups, whatever the, the content may be? Um, but yes, and certainly if you have a specific, if they have a specific question about a, a specific lab, please email us info at argumentdriveninquiry.com. Our PL team does an amazing job of supporting teachers. Great, great. Hey, another uh, interesting question. Um, I don't understand why ADI labs have so much information front loaded before the actual experience. And I've noticed that too. I think that's actually, I think that's a, a benefit, but maybe you can explain that a bit. Yeah, absolutely. So we really kind of want a, a one-stop place for students to have information. And we really think it's important to put, um, you know, the information out there for them to start. So again, what is our task? What is the scientific concepts that we're looking into? And then why is that important? And our labs are kind of divided between introductory labs. So in some cases, the students have not been exposed to this content before. Um, and in other cases, we have application labs. So they would have heard about the content already, but we wanna give them um, you know, just some key terms, phrases, and some information to, to reference. Because even though they're reading it, we all know it doesn't necessarily hit home until they've interacted with it in a, in a variety of ways. Great, great, thanks. You know, one thing I'll say too, looking through the chat, there's a lot of ADI fans out there. It sounds like a lot of awesome. your teacher fans. Thank you. 